We're getting tons of great talks today about some of the really cool things that you can do in Swift that we weren't able to before. And thus today is really a great day for Swift and Swift developers because it's really looking towards the future. This talk is going to be a little different than that. Um, I want to look at maybe one of the main things that we've lost in the transition to the great Swiftening. And that's one of the, a very powerful language feature that uh, those of us who've been writing Objective-C for a while um, kind of know as introspection or dynamic reflection. And I'll uh, get into when that is for, uh, in, in just a second. So, so what is what I'm referring to as introspection? What is dynamic reflection of types? Well, it can be a very powerful tool for creating really elegant and delightful APIs. Um, it can allow a code base to use some of the information that a developer has already given it in ways that aren't necessarily traditional at runtime. And so if it's done right, it can be delightful, powerful, and even safer than the alternatives. So as an example, and let's look at something concrete so that uh, you, you have somewhere a foundation to base this concept off of. In Objective-C, there's a number of fantastic frameworks that really leverage dynamic runtime introspection. And one of those frameworks is Mantle. You know, it's a great way to, for example, you define a class like this, and you automatically get a lot of very powerful uh, things like J JSON mapping or uh, JSON importing. And so it's leveraging the modeling information that's already present in classes or in structs, and it's leveraging that to build something that's very powerful. So it cuts out on, on developer uh, writing code. Some other interesting projects that do this in a different way are FC Model and Realm. So now I work at Realm, so I can kind of explain a little bit how we use this in Objective-C. Whenever you define one of your data models, for example, an employee here, well, you can say that it has a name, a start date, a salary, a full-time Boolean, and all of these have property names and types. And then we can look at that and just pull down a database schema from that information that you've already given the system. So it cuts down on a lot of time trying to keep different systems in check and in sync. And so it can really create some pretty powerful APIs. Now, question is, and actually Corinne uh, alluded to this earlier, Swift has very limited support for this kind of dynamic introspection. In fact, Swift is the very opposite of dynamic by default. Right? It tries to move as much of the logic and as much of the power towards compile time, which is really great overall, but I'd say that this is one of the few features that actually tend to suffer from this. And so if we wanted to build this back into Swift, or if we want to adapt to the ways that we build APIs, how do we do this? Well, join me on this swan dive into the technical abyss that is building back introspection into Swift. And so I think that there are really six categories, six ways that we can introspect Swift. And uh, I'll go through them one by one here. The, the first one is to stick with what the compiler and the type system and the languages and standard library gives you. Right? So it's really playing by the rules. Um, we can look at applying dynamic casting. Dynamic casting is anytime you see the as, you know, with inflection, the as question mark. It's when you're trying to dynamically cast uh, a type into something else. We could leverage Swift's mirror type. So Swift actually has some official built-in support for reflection. It's just quite limited. Uh, we could go a step further and abuse Objective-C's runtime. You know, Swift and Objective-C share a lot in common under the hood for certain special cases. So we could do that. We could even resort to using private functions. There's a number of really nice gems that we can find in Swift standard library that uh, allow us to do really powerful things. And then the very last resort should be to inspect memory layout. So to look at a pointer address for an object or a class or a type and then say, okay, well, if we poke around a little further and a little before, can we see how this thing is structured? Now, you might have noticed that this list gets progressively worse, as in progressively not playing by the rules. And that's why I also call this the six degrees of evil, where Sure, the first one is completely safe, playing, playing by the rules, and pretty much all the way down to four, you, know, you can probably ship something in production that uses this stuff because it's using publicly facing APIs. But then you get to five, and then you get to six, and you get to really powerful things 
that allow you to do a lot more than the ones preceding that, but that, that are kind of evil at the same time. You know, you, maybe you'd have to think several times over before you actually ship any product that's using that. But it, it can, you can do really cool things. And so let's take a look at approach number one, which is really the friendliest of approaches. Um, and that's to use what Swift gives you and really encourage you, encourages you to, to, to use. So that's things like leveraging the type system to, to pass in uh, objects that are constrained on protocols or objects that are constrained on types that have further constraints, you know, sequence type where generator.element equals, uh, you know, string. So to really use, and, and really this way is to avoid doing any sort of runtime introspection. It is, this approach is don't do it at all. Find another way. And there are actually some great projects out there uh, in Swift that are doing, taking this approach. And if they'd been written in Objective-C, they'd probably be using some sort of runtime introspection. And one of these is uh, QueryKit. And so QueryKit kind of looks at um, a structure or a model, in this case, my struct that has an int property. And then from there, we're asking the user to explicitly state what kind of properties it has so that we can do things later on like type safe uh, NS predicate building, things like int property must be over zero. You know, so this, uh, this is a very powerful approach, but it does require the user to do a little bit more work. And it's not super safe, because what if you make a mistake as you're putting in the string in prop? What if you end up changing that property over time? You know? So it's, it's not quite as safe as if it was completely generated at runtime. But it's still a very powerful concept. And then Argo, which is a JSON parsing library, does this in a slightly different way as well, where they're requiring a, a number of additional functions uh, that, that users have to declare in, in type conformance, that users have to declare in their types, but at least it's extremely safe and it's extremely explicit. There, there's zero magic happening here. Or there's a lot less magic happening here. And so that's really approach number one. The safe way is to just not do it. Find another way. And in these projects, it actually makes a lot of sense. Approach number two is um, kind of a substitute for instance reflection, uh, or kind of a substitute for the Swift, the, the Objective-C equivalent of is kind of class. And that's the dynamic casting keyword as question mark. And so one way that you could do this, for example, this is used in Swift XPC. It's a bridge that'll convert native Swift types to, uh, to XPC types. XPC is an inter, inter process protocol that Apple uses. Interprocess communication protocol. And so in this case, we're passing in an object that could either be an int64 or a string. In any case, it conforms to XPC convertible. And then we switch on it. We say, well, could this be cast as an int64? Could this be cast as a string? And if so, well, then we fork our code. And so this is kind of taking a, a more Swift-approved uh, approach to dynamic reflection. Now, the problem with this is that you require an instance. You can't just reflect a class or a struct if you haven't constructed it yet, which is kind of problematic in certain situations. And uh, it's also a shame because you have to special case every single type that you want to support. So if we wanted to add conformance to, let's say, NS date to this, well, then we'd also have to modify our switch statement. And, and the compiler wouldn't help us there. We'd have to remember to do it. Uh, approach number three is to use what uh, Apple has blessed us with, which is the official Swift reflection, which is really quite limited. Um, and so if we look at the Swift standard library, you'll look at its interface and you'll see this mirror type protocol. Well, you can call reflect on an instance and then get all of these goodies, all of this information, things like um, the number of properties that it has or what kind of object that it is or what value that it holds, if it does hold a value. So this is uh, really an Apple-approved way of doing this. And then you can take it further and kind of replace the example that we had, had before, where um, you can automatically see what all the properties on a type are. And so this is a pretty powerful technique, but again, pretty serious limitations where you need to pass in an instance. And even then, you need to special case. You'll, you'll notice the, uh, the dynamic casting here again, the as question mark keyword. We have to special case every property type that it could be to figure out what, what type it would. So if you look at the comment uh, at the bottom of this code sample, you'll see the property name equals whatever value it holds, and then the type of the property printed right after. So kind of a shame that we have to, we require an instance here, and we need to special case every type that we want to support. So that's what leads us to approach number four, 
which um, actually it turns out that Swift classes are almost identical to Objective-C classes under the hood. And that's why the runtime can interoperate so easily in some special cases. You know, if you're inheriting from NSObject, or if you use at obc, or if you use the terrible hack that is at NSManaged. So if you do all of these things, then you can actually leverage the Objective-C runtime. And so this is calling into runtime.h from Swift, where you can actually pass in an instance and then uh, iterate over the properties and print out the property names and the attribute types. So that's what you see in the comment there. Now you'll notice that the int property isn't being printed. That's because Objective-C can't represent an optional int as we've defined in our obj sub. So an int in Objective-C is a primitive and it cannot be nil. It can be zero or any other integer value. And so in that case, well, the runtime introspection just plants. You know, it doesn't like this. Uh, which are, brings us to approach number five, which is really starting to get to the fun stuff, but also the kind of morally questionable uh, behavior that you could do. And that's to use private functions. Well, first of all, how would you find private functions in the Swift interface? You know, there's no, you can't necessarily use something like obviously class dump like we would necessarily do in Objective-C. But you can print out all of the names of the symbols in the Swift standard library dialib. And so here in this case, uh, if you find the Swift, uh, the, the Swift standard library dialib, and then you grep for stdlib, you'll find all of these goodies. And you know, the first one that you see there is get demangled type name. That one's pretty useful. There's also a number of other things, conforms to protocol. Ooh, that, that's actually kind of nice. Um, get type name, dynamic cast. So there's a number of, uh, of interesting goodies that you can find in there, but you know, those might be removed at any version of Swift. So it's starting to get a little, a little nefarious in our purposes here. But by using this, we don't have to special case every single property type anymore. We don't have to be aware of it beforehand because we can just call uh, the, the last line of code here, which is standard lib get demangled type name for the value that we passed in. And then in that case, we're not special casing every single property type that we want to support. Yet, if you look at the comments at the bottom, we're still printing out all of the relevant information. But again, here, same example as earlier, we need to pass in an instance. And there are cases in which that is just not feasible. For example, in Swift, you, you have no guarantees that you can just call uh, the regular initializer, you know, the open and close parens, or the, obje the Objective-C equivalent of alloc init. You know, so you can't just pass in a class and create an instance to pass it to this reflection. So if you wanted to do something like what FC model and Mantle and Realm does in Objective-C, which is really to introspect types before we even do anything, you know, at application launch, what can you do? Well, you have to really resort to the most evil of the six approaches, and that's to inspect the raw memory layout. And the reason why I say that's evil is that this can change at any given moment. I mean, Swift has sort of like a silver lining for this because you end up shipping the standard library. And so odds are that it's going to be pretty safe because if it works one day, well, it's just going to keep on working the next. But nonetheless, it's still really diving into some of the private internals. And Apple won't necessarily be happy if you do this. You know, this is Ire of Sauron evil. It's, it's pretty bad. If, in fact, if you do this, it's likely that Chris Latner will find you and tell you, don't do it. He will find you and make your Xcode crash even more than it does. But nonetheless, you can do some really cool things with it. Uh, for example, so here's how it would work under the hood. Um, and this is really the result of, uh, of, of lots of work by some really smart people. Um, you have John Holdsworth and Jay Freeman, who, as soon as Swift came out, really started digging into it and popping it into a disassembler and figuring out exactly what the structure was. And so this is. Uh, the, the internal structures that Swift uses for its classes, for example. And they've done the same thing with structs and, and a number of other types. Um, and so for those of you who understand how, how Objective-C classes work, you know, under the hood with, uh, with the is a pointer and, and basically the, the layout, this is very, very similar. And so by having these types, we can basically just dump whatever we have in memory where whatever the class is defined or the type uh, the protocol or the struct is defined or the enum and just pipe it into these structures and all of a sudden we have this nice way to manipulate uh, what's actually been defined in these classes um, or in these types. And so from there we can do some really powerful stuff. Like we can throw this kind of information 
um, at, uh, at runtime. So where we have generic classes, we have Objective-C subclasses, we have classes with properties, some of them are uh, var, some of them are let, some of them are optional, some of them have default values, others have values that can't be represented in Objective-C. We're basically just throwing a potpourri of all sorts of different types here. And if we pipe that in through our runtime introspection of, of memory layout, we get all of the relevant information. You know, bool prop is of type B, and int prop is of type I, and we didn't have to construct an instance of this type. You know, all we have to do is take a look and basically pass in the fact that, hey, uh, Mr. Magical or Mrs. Magical System under the hood here, um, what does parent class contain? And we get all this information, including uh, things like the module name in a type definition, or in a type declaration, rather. And if you have generic properties, well, those will be mangled. But from there, you can go back a few slides and take a look at step number five, which was to use private functions, and you can demangle it. Uh, so this approach actually gets us really, really far. But you have limited occasions where you can actually use this in, in a safe and production-worthy setting. So again, why are we going through all this trouble of kind of finding an esoteric um, functionality for the language that the people at Apple don't necessarily want to expose, and with good reason? You know, this stuff can and does break all the time. Um, so why are we even trying to do this? Well, again, runtime introspection can be a super powerful tool for creating really elegant, powerful, and safe APIs when it's done right. And so that's why we're looking into it. And so at Realm, we make a database. And we want the same kind of powerful features that we have in Objective-C ported over to Swift. And we want to use it in a very swift way. And so by trying to stick to, actually by sticking to all of the approaches that are really official and sanctioned, we've still managed to do something like this. Where at runtime, as long as you have objects that are defined like these, you know, an employee object, with properties, and uh, you have generics defined on a company with other objects, and you have optionals. You know, at runtime, we can take a look at this and preactively generate a database schema. And then from then on, you just use these regular Swift objects, and they're backed by a database. You know, so they can create really powerful APIs. And uh, you know, all, of this, all of our work here has been open source, and so we really welcome others to do the same and to create really powerful tools. So again, these are the ways that you can introspect Swift. Uh, and there are lots of resources that I use, lots of really great code out there. Um, that's all available here. So I'd like to thank you for listening. And if you have questions afterwards, make sure to grab me. Uh, and I just want to leave you on one last note. Please don't be evil. But if you do, try to do something cool with it. Thanks.